Welcome to the Pardon My Pancreas podcast. I'm stoked to have you here, but also stoked to bring you another special guest. Now, today we've got Nelani Hunsaker, who is a PA or a physician assistant. But the cool thing about her is that she's a type 1 diabetic who sees type 1 diabetic patients. Really cool to see both perspectives in this one. And we had a great conversation that I cannot wait to share with you. So be sure to, to sit down, take notes, listen up. We've even got a special announcement for you at the end of the episode. All right, let's get into our theme song. I've spent the last 10 years pushing the limits while identifying trends and patterns in my type 1 diabetes management. Follow along as I learn, apply, and share the fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle strategies that I've learned from diabetes experts around the world. The real question is, how can we live fearlessly with diabetes while maintaining stable blood sugars? This podcast is here to give you the answer. My name is Matt Vandevecht, head coach and co-founder of FTF Warrior, and welcome to Part of My Pancreas. Welcome back to the Part of My Pancreas podcast. So excited to have you listening here today with us because I've got a special guest. We've got Nelani Hunsaker, and she's going to tell us all about her perspective within the medical industry, but she's also living with type 1 diabetes as well, so we get both sides of that perspective. Nelani, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thanks, Scott, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. And uh, before we jump into you know your life with diabetes, I'd like our audience to kind of know what it is that you do. What's your title? What's your, your job overall within uh, the medical field? Okay. Um, I'm a physician assistant specializing in advanced diabetes management. I recently took a new position at Apex Healthcare in the Inland Empire, where I'm the Associate Director of the Diabetes Program, and I'm also on the faculty for the Internal Medicine Residency Program that they have, and uh, we're actually starting an endocrinology fellowship, so I'll be on faculty for that as well. Um, and then I'm also the PA student clerkship director for APEX. So I get to do a lot of teaching um, of both clinicians and then obviously my patients as well. So I absolutely love my job. I'm so passionate about it. And I love that I can relate to the patients on, our, on a very personal level. For sure. Yeah, I'm kind of jealous that I didn't have someone like you that was understanding, but also knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. That. I honestly wish I had somebody who was understanding and knowledgeable when I was a kid too. And I think that's pretty much why I went into what I'm doing now is because I didn't have that, like many people don't. So thanks. Very true. And I know that you mentioned like, and also, and also like you've got so many different things you're doing. It's incredible. I'm assuming that's Thank why you, you have like five certificates on the wall behind you. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I, I like to do everything that I can to advance my uh, knowledge about diabetes and just make sure that I am at the top of my game when it comes to taking care of my patients. So um, I just took my board certification in advanced diabetes management a couple of weeks ago. So I'm looking forward to putting that on the wall too. Hopefully I'll, you know, find out if I pass this month. So that's exciting. Congrats. I'm sure you passed. I mean, come on, you got all those certs. It's going to be amazing. Uh, but you mentioned advanced diabetes management. That's got me curious now. What does that even mean? So um, basically, what that is is uh, you you know what, what the certification in um, diabetes education is the CDE. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's typically um, given to dietitians and, and nurses and all the, these amazing team members that we have. Um, someone who's board certified in advanced diabetes management is um, similar, but at the level of having prescribing um, capabilities. So someone who is a, a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, maybe a pharmacist. Um, so someone who can prescribe who goes through and takes the board exam for diabetes. And it, it's 175 questions. Um, it was four hours long, oh. way too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so it's basically um, just showing that you know all the ADA standards, you know, you're very well versed in diabetes. 
Um, you can run uh, diabetes prevention programs through your clinic. So like I, like I mentioned, I just want to make sure I'm at the top of my game for my patients and you know, that I know everything that I can possibly know and give that to my patients. So that's what I try to do. That is just so refreshing to hear that. Like, not only are you, you at the level of I can help diabetics, but you want to be at the top of your game in order to help yeah. them more. That's just, that's really. Exciting. Yeah. I think as a clinician, no matter what type of clinician you are, you should, you should never be satisfied with what you know, and you should always be looking for more things to learn and doing more research because um, you owe that to your patients. Um, that's my personal opinion. So that's how I practice. Yeah. And I think that there's so many new strategies that come out every year, new meds, new technologies, that if mm -hmm. you don't continue learning, you're going to get left behind, right? And Honestly, yes, it is. It is hard to keep up with everything that's going on in diabetes right now. There's just so much. It's there. It's I always say having diabetes sucks, but it's a really good time to have it because the, <laughs> everything is booming in the diabetes world and it's so exciting, but it is hard to keep up with. So I love, you know, learning things from reading, but then also I learn things from my patients who come in and have done their own research. And then I can, of course, take that and do my own um, kind of digging into it, but there's so much going on right now. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a, it is a great time to have an unfortunate disease. <laughs> right, exactly. So cool things. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned so that the advanced diabetes management certification or license certification. Yeah, it's the certification, board okay. certification. Yeah. So with that, you mentioned prescribing. Is that right? Mm hmm. So I should fly to you to get my insulin now. That we're gonna do <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, I would be happy to see you, but we can also do, I also do telemedicine. So I actually, oh, there you go. Yeah. So I've been able to see, um, a lot of my patients that I had at my own practice who live in San Diego, I can still see them even though I'm in Menifee, which is a, a long drive, but <laughs> you found a loophole. That's so perfect. I, I did. Yes, I did. So telemedicine is awesome. And diabetes lends itself so well to telemedicine um, because a lot of it is just looking at patterns and analyzing data. So as long as you can get that data, you can, you can really see anybody with diabetes anywhere if they would let us. There's, you know, certain requirements, but <laughs> anyone in California, I can see. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned it's, it's all boils down to that data pattern analysis uh, mm -hmm. from a provider's perspective. Is that the one, one side of this question is, is that the number one thing that you look for? And the other side of the question is, is that the hardest thing to get your patients to do? analyze their own patterns. Yeah, I, I, I guess that question also shifts now that we have CGMs that just match it up for you. Because before mm -hmm. it was write it down or bring your meter, right? Mm -hmm. and to get people to write stuff down, I can only imagine is difficult as a provider. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, I guess now, uh, since it just automatically uploads, all I gotta do is plug it in. Uh, yeah. Is it more so that this is just going over data with them on these telehealth appointments? Well, most of the time, I, I, I don't know if I'm the same uh, how everybody else is with this, but for me, I like my patients to be really involved in their own care. So I don't like to just tell them what I see. I like them to tell me what they see and then, or what they've noticed. And then I'll, you know, address that obviously, because if it's something they're telling me, even if I don't see it, it's obviously something that's bothering them. So we need to talk about it, but it's, it's a collaborative effort. You know, I always tell my patients, this is your diabetes. I have my own diabetes to do with it. Okay? <laughs> I can't, I can't take on your diabetes too. So, um, I, I usually ask them what my first question will be something along the lines of what patterns are you noticing in your blood sugar? Or is there anything specific you want to talk about in regard to your diabetes? Um, and, and that's, that's where we start. And then I'll tell them sort of what I see after they've shared with me what they know. And so 
sometimes it takes a little bit of, um, of time to get them to shift the way that they think about their diabetes. Um, but after a couple of appointments, typically patients will just volunteer that information because they know I'm going to ask it. And because they know I'm going to ask it, they tend to think about it more between the appointments. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we need a megaphone on top of the mountain to like every endocrinologist and PA should do this because you yeah. asking them, what do you see? Not only involves them more, but like you said, it gets them thinking differently. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I need to be aware of, huh, I go high every morning, but just in the morning, mm -hmm. right? That's it's interesting, yeah. good data. And why? So that's yeah. the other thing I asked them. So why do you think this happens? Like just today, I had a patient who, was telling me he always goes high in the morning and he doesn't eat anything and he doesn't know why he goes high in the morning. So I said, okay, we had to go through, you know, his routine and we figured out that he's maybe not eating anything, but he's drinking coffee in the mornings. And a lot of people have problems with hyperglycemia after coffee if they don't cover it. So just, you know, getting someone to think through things is is one of, it's one of my top priorities when I have the patients in the office with me or via telehealth, because um, I want them to be empowered and know that they can manage their own diabetes. They don't need me. I'm just a tool to help, help them, but, but it's really their diabetes and they're the ones managing it. Absolutely. And I think that sets them up for more success in between appointments as well, because now they can think ahead and go, that's a pattern. I'm noticing, that, okay, why did that happen though? And they can try to make adjustments. Do you encourage adjustments actually uh, with their insulin or more so just habitual? No, I encourage them to make adjustments um, mm. with their insulin as well, depend, kind of depending on what their comfort level is. But I always teach them to do their adjustments and why I'm doing them the way that I'm doing them. Like I'll tell them why we're starting the basal rate at this time versus maybe right before the pattern happens. So we talk through that so that they know in the future, if they need to make a change, they're, they're going to make the correct change. Um, but I also tell them, you know, don't change it by too much at a time, maybe 10%, uh, you know, increase or decrease so that they don't do anything drastic. Right. Um, and of course, I tell them, if you have any questions about any changes you're making, please just call me. Don't hesitate to call the office and we can go through it together because, um, I want to make sure they're comfortable, but we always do it together. It's never one of those things where I grab their pump and change it for them and give it back to them because I think it's really important that they know how to do their own stuff. And thank goodness I've done that since the beginning because with telemedicine, I can't imagine having to explain to yeah. every patient how to change their settings on their pump. Yeah. Like, yeah, they already know how to do it. So I'll just say, go into your basal profile and, you know, so. So yeah, that's an amazing <laughs> transition that you, just, I sounds like you got lucky with, but also you were just a good provider in the first place. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, because yeah, I've heard these horror stories of doctors hiding the screens, like looking at it, changing it and handing it back. And then the patient has no idea what just happened. Yeah. What did you change? Why did you change it? I don't know. That should work. Good luck. You know, it's like, oh man. So you're doing it right. That's super exciting. Uh, but you mentioned, you know, diabetes advanced or advanced diabetes management cert allows you to kind of work through with prescriptions. I'm curious. I know I, I follow you on Instagram and I see you trying a lot of new stuff all the mm -hmm. time and explaining why it works, how it works, uh, you know, different types of insulins and, and different strategies. Is that how you get a hold of it? That you are you able to prescribe it or are there samples or like, how do you get this so new stuff? The, um, the, the 
advanced diabetes management certification is only available to people who already have prescribing authority. So it doesn't oh. give you the prescribing authority. You have to already have it in order to sit for the exam. Gotcha. So I, I am, a, I do have full prescriptive authority. Um, so I can, I can write for insulin, right. You know, for whatever, uh, my patients need, um, and b besides uh, some of the controlled substances, uh, but otherwise I have full prescriptive authority. So um, a lot of the time I just, I want to try things before my patients try them because most often that's how I learn the best. <laughs> <laughs> and also because my patients ask me, well, what did you think of it? So I'm, you know, I like to be able to give an opinion of, you know, or tell them about an experience that I had with that product. So, but honestly, almost every product I've tried, I've had a good experience with. Hmm. So, Okay. I'm curious then what got you into this, like experimenting mindset of just trying new things? Is it general curiosity or was it I want to find the best thing for me. I want to be a good example for my patients. How did that start? Trying all these new things. Um, I think it just started when I was a kid. Like growing up, um, I didn't have an endocrinologist and I didn't have, so I grew up in Hawaii and um, they didn't have an endocrinologist on the island I grew up on. And then they didn't have a pediatric endocrinologist in the state. Mm -hmm. So I pretty much did most things with my parents. Um, we did a lot of like trial and error on most things. And so that's sort of where my mindset came from. And I think the idea of trying things before someone I care about tries them also came from my parents because um, when I was a kid, my, my dad and my mom would both try things before I did. Um, but neither of them have diabetes, but for instance, before I got on an insulin pump, both of them wore the pump with saline for an entire week, just to make sure that it would be something that would fit into my lifestyle. Wow. So I mean, obviously my patients aren't like the same as my kid, but I do care about them quite a lot. And they have a very special place in my heart. So maybe it's sort of like a, a protective thing where I'm like, <laughs> I need to try it first and make sure it's safe and make sure that I can appropriately coach people on how to work through whatever they're going to go through on this new technology or medication. So, yeah. I mean, I only try things within reason and I always do it safely. Um, but it is important to me that I can, um, that I can try things before I prescribe them. And thankfully I can do that because I have diabetes. Um, I don't know how anybody can take care of people with diabetes who, if they don't have diabetes themselves, it must be <laughs> right? really challenging. Like, I think I have it much easier than everybody else. For sure, because you have that firsthand experience of, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. The roller coaster highs and lows and, oh, it knocked you out because you're just wiped out from the lows all night. Yeah, that, I've done that. And you're like, yeah, oh, exactly. Amazing. I'm like, I feel that. I know exactly what that's <laughs> like. You mentioned uh, your parents tried everything out first. I hope they didn't try insulin first. No, no, okay, just saline, <laughs> just the saline. But we did used to call my dad um, the pin cushion because when oh. I was first learning how to give injections and stuff, I, he would let me like practice on him using oh saline. Goodness. So I was so scared of the needles and he was like, he was just amazing. So I practiced on him and then I was comfortable enough to do it on myself. So, <laughs> Wow, that's incredible. A parent's yeah. love. I love it. Thank goodness for great parents. Yeah, for sure. So in the uh, the experimental phases that you've gone through, it sounds like since childhood, uh, were there any that stuck out to you that were either shocking or big aha moments? I mean, my only, my first thought is maybe something like a, an ultra fast acting insulin going, oh, wow, that's way faster than I mm -hmm. thought it was going to be. 
but are there any moments like that that stuck out to you through those experimentation <clears throat> journeys? Um, I can actually think of kind of a lot. Like what the first thing I think of is when I was 10 and I was starting on an insulin pump because that changed my whole world as far as how flexible my life could be. Mm. Um, because it was very regimented before regimented before that, as far as like, you needed to eat at this time and then, you know, have a snack and this is how much I was allowed to eat. And then, you know, just based on matching carbohydrates to insulin. Um, so having the ability to just press a few buttons and have more of a snack or like eat more than I had originally planned was kind of a big aha moment. Hmm. Um, and then the next aha moment didn't come until I was um, a PA student and I did my um, it, one of my rotations at my uh, original, my first practice in San Diego, um, where I first got introduced to CGM. Mm. And CGM is honestly the best thing to ever happen to diabetes, if you <laughs> ask me. Um, it was like, oh, this whole world opened up. Um, I can't believe I ever functioned without CGM, to be honest. <laughs> um, and even now, like when I had to go through my like two hour warm up period, mm -hmm. I just, oh, I hate it so much. <laughs> um, so then there was that. And then when I started on my current therapy, my mini med 670G system, having the hybrid closed loop system, it like, made me realize how much anxiety I actually had around diabetes because all of a sudden I felt like this whole weight was lifted off my shoulders because I didn't have to constantly think about my diabetes every 10 minutes. Like I did not realize how often my brain went to what's your blood sugar? What's your blood sugar? How wow. much insulin do you have? Are you going to go low? And it was especially amazing. Like one day I was in my practice and I was like seeing patients and I went over into my lunch hour and like, I didn't even realize it where normally I would have gone low probably by fasting for that long. I didn't. And it was mm. like, Oh my gosh, this is the most amazing therapy ever. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like, one of my biggest ones of my adult life was when I realized that I didn't have to have this super OCD um, type of relationship with diabetes um, that I could let technology help me with that. And then I could save my brain power for something else. <laughs> yeah, it's super, super cool. And I think, again, that's based on the CGM helping out, right? CGM telling your pump what to do. I totally agree. CGM changed the entire game of diet. Mm -hmm. Initially Total game changer. in like a, a negative way in my head, because I was like, Ooh, it's that bad. Yeah. <laughs> Saw totally. the big spikes after meals and was like, Oh, I thought I had a better control than that. <laughs> you know, what's so funny is that happens all the time with my patients. Like mm. when I put them on CGM, they think I did something to them. They're like, <laughs> They're telling, they're calling me saying, this thing is making my blood sugars high. And I have to tell them, no, you had these high blood sugars this whole time, but now you're just seeing them. And, and then it's all of a sudden, you know, it, it's good because it's a good motivational tool. It makes them realize like, oh, I really do need to kick it into gear because a lot of the time patients will wake up with like pretty good fasting blood sugars, especially if they have type two diabetes, maybe they'll have, you know, good fasting blood sugars and then they'll eat. And all of a sudden they go up to like the two or three hundreds and they never knew it because they were only testing their fasting blood sugars. True. So now they know, and then I can convince them to make changes. <laughs> <laughs> you're like see this graph that keeps showing a pattern that's yeah that's, it needs to change <laughs> yeah exactly exactly oh so. man okay so over the years then you know level of experimenting has brought new therapy options to you to your awareness 
uh, with the pump and then the CGM and then the hybrid closed loop. Uh, I know you've tried different insulins, different, mm-hmm. have you tried the, the glucagons that are out there or it just have? No, I haven't. I haven't tried them. Have you ever used a glucagon? I have never needed to use one. Oh, good. Have you? I have not. Uh, I've, I've paid lots of money every year for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here. Same like, here. I don't want to use you, but I hate the idea of wasting all this money, but it's not a waste because it's safety net. It's like right. this weird inner dialogue, right? Yeah, I always have it with me. I keep I keep my back see me in my purse. And oh, I, good. but yeah, I, I thankfully have never had to use it. Um, yeah. One good tip that I always have to tell my patients is it's not enough just to have it. You have to tell someone where it is because the whole point of glucagon and vaccine is to help you when you can't help yourself. But if nobody knows where things are, then, you know, they can't do anything about it. So I tell everyone where my, my glucagon pen and my vaccine are located. That's a great idea. And when you say everyone, are you telling strangers in the street? Like, hey, just in case. Right. <laughs> yeah, hey there. <laughs> no, uh, like all my, my coworkers, um, you know, my MA knows where it is, my husband, people mm-hmm. I spend the most time with. Yeah, wonderful idea. Because you're absolutely right. The whole point is, this is when you're bordering on unconscious, someone might need to do it when you're not able mm-hmm. to. So if they don't know how to use it, there's no point in having it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, love that tip, by the way. And within the, uh, the experimental phase, I think that from a, a provider's perspective, you mentioned that you encourage your patients to not only take a look at their patterns, but if they're able to, to make small changes, right. And small shifts mm-hmm. in their own life. Uh, I think that's, I've heard that from other providers, but I feel like that's not as common as it needs to be, uh, because providers, I, I think personally, they're fearful of giving control of their patients because it could be dangerous. Is that fair mm-hmm. to say? Absolutely. I think a lot of providers are scared even, I mean, so insulin is probably one of the more scary drugs for any provider because of what it can do, especially in patients with type one, just the smallest change can make a huge difference and it can be very dangerous. So I think a lot of providers get scared of what could happen if patients start all of a sudden changing things on their own. And I think that's a very valid fear. But I also think that people are going to do it anyways. So you might as well teach them how to do it in the right way. See, I love that thought process as well, because I I hear that they might be scared of what their patients could do. But that also makes me think that they're not willing to take the time to educate them on how to do it. And that's why they're scared. They're going to, it's going to be a dangerous situation. So, you know, people like you who've taken that time to educate when somebody has limited access to a doctor that may not want them to make changes on their own, would you say it's enough to get education, to read the books, talk to their other dia buddies? At what point should they feel confident to make their own small adjustments? I think after they've done it enough with their provider, then they probably should feel confident. Um, I think there's, like you mentioned, a lot of great resources out there as far as books go. Um, My favorite book for, um, for insulin pumping tips is called Pumping Insulin. It's by John Walsh. He's also a PA. Um, And yeah, I used to work with him, but he, he wrote the book on, um, pumping insulin. He's amazing. He's actually the reason I became a PA when it comes down to it. Yeah. I met him when I was a kid. Um, he, I was 10 and I met him at a conference and he was like the first person I'd ever seen who had diabetes and actually used it as a strength and used it to help other people. And my mom, after his talk, she sort of did the mom thing and you know, ran up to him and introduced us. And he was so Come on, Elani. Exactly. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, mom, come (laughs) on. I'm 10, right? And so he was so kind. He actually, he flew to Kauai because the conference was on a different island. He flew to Kauai and like had dinner with my parents and I, he came to my science fair. He was just so nice and so impactful in my life. 
um, just in the way that, that it made me realize that I could actually have a successful career and I could help other people. And so I kind of decided at that moment that I wanted to be a PA, like even though I really, I don't even know that I knew exactly what that was, but that's what <laughs> I wanted to do. And um, because I wanted to be like John. So mm-hmm. that's basically how I ended up becoming a PA. And then when I got into school, I, I wrote to him, I found his email online, but we hadn't talked since I was 10. And I wrote to him asking if he would preceptor me. And he said, yes. And then I ended up at that clinic with a bunch of amazing providers. And that's where I started out. So Mm. he's amazing. And he is so knowledgeable, but I love his book, Pumping Insulin. And I think that's a really great book for people who are interested in taking charge of their diabetes um, to read. That's awesome. Have you ever told him that he's the reason you became a PA? I tell him all the time. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he knows. He absolutely knows. Yeah, he's he has like been my mentor. So I I mean I'm not no longer at the same practice with him, but we still, you know, keep in touch constantly. So that's amazing. Yeah. So from your perspective then, uh, you know, changing insulin dosing, that's a pretty serious thing. You should probably know what you're doing before you do that, even if it is yes. small adjustments. Yes. But outside of insulin adjustments, uh, whether it's trying new strategies, maybe it's a CGM, maybe it's uh, trying pre-bolus timing, how important is it for a patient to be open to experimentation versus living in a rigid routine and never changing? I think it sort of depends on what the patient wants. Um, I mean, that's what that is one thing another thing that I tend to ask my patients is what do you want to get out of this relationship um what kind of life do you want you know um some people live very well with a regimented life and they like it and as long as their diabetes is controlled and they're not at risk for complications if that's the way they want to live I'm totally fine with that it's not how I would want to live Um, And I make sure to let them know, you know, if you're open to this or that or the other, you know, we can try different things to maybe give you a little bit more flexibility and a little more freedom. But some people don't necessarily want or need that. And that's fine. Like I mentioned, it's their diabetes. It's not mine. I'm just here to help and be a resource to them. So um, but but then when it comes to other people and a lot of young people, they don't want that rigid life. And that's so understandable. And I would not want that either. So I think it is important that patients are willing to experiment, but within reason and with the right guidance. Yeah, I think within reason is a great place to start for somebody who wants that spontaneous lifestyle, adventurous lifestyle that might require experimentation. Uh, let's say they don't have access to an amazing healthcare provider like yourself. What would be a great first step for them to enter into that land of curiosity with diabetes? Would it be reading books? Would it be, uh, I don't know, f- looking up your Instagram? <laughs> What's a, a great place to start for these people? I honestly think the social media community is a really great resource. Um, you have to be careful about where you're looking because sometimes you know, people like to play clinician when they're, you know, not, but um, I think for the most part, there's a lot of really awesome um, people out there just trying to help and trying to educate and share what they know about diabetes. Um, There's, I mean, there's so many influencers on Instagram who I'm connected with, and I'm sure you're connected with too, who are really great coaches, like yourself included. So I think um, there's so many good resources online now, which is awesome. And it's something that I didn't have growing up, and I'm sure you didn't either. You know, it's kind of a newer newer things. So it, it is, it is pretty amazing. I definitely would recommend that. Also there's conferences like TCOID. That's really cool. And just such a great place for people to learn and build community. So there are so many places to look. Um, I definitely recommend conferences and just reaching out to people online. 
especially right now when you can't actually physically go anywhere. <laughs> so true. Yeah. And uh, with the world still changing and, and kind of morphing into whatever the next world version is <laughs> mm -hmm. online is still there it's never changed and if anything it's stronger now because people are forced into an online space where they're able to connect more and realize the the potential of the diabetic online community where it's exactly like, holy cow i have access to all these cool people um you know putting up their own stories and all this great stuff and uh you know you mentioned that there's a lot of great people to follow obviously you're one of them uh, Thank you. So I wanted to kind of give you a chance and everybody who's listening, I know they're curious, where can people find you? Oh, okay. Um, so uh, my Instagram handle is at diabetes underscore PA. And that's where I do a lot of my educational things, you know, um, for people that aren't my patients. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also have a website, it's diabetespa.net. Um, and on both in both of those locations, I have uh, my practice information also. So if you are in California and you're interested in having an appointment with me, um, telemedicine or in person, I am taking patients and I'm happy to see you. I would love, you know, love to see you. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's where I am. That's how you find me. That's amazing. I actually might have a friend that I'm going to send your way. I didn't know you were taking patients. <laughs> yeah, you should. You should definitely That's so should. Cool. That yeah. would be great. Uh, but on that note, actually, you mentioned, you know, social media, great spot. Everyone go follow Nailani. She has a great page. But <laughs> the conferences that are online now, TCOID, great, great resource as well. I've been there myself. But we, you and I had a project we worked on recently. Can you tell a little sneak peek into uh, what happened there and what's going on. Yeah. So you guys, Matt is so awesome. And he put together this awesome conference for, for everybody. And um, pretty much we talk about, you know, if I could go back in time and coach myself uh, about how, how to manage diabetes or like what tips I would give to myself as a kid when I was first diagnosed and, I think it's going to be really cool. I'm looking forward to hearing other people's answers because I'm sure there's a lot of dynamic uh, answers and content that you're going to share. So I really look forward to it. I'm super stoked for it too. Uh, so for everybody listening and watching, Neilani is actually on that summit. She's one of our featured speakers. So if you want to hear more about her story, what she would coach herself on, along with 30 other experts, leaders, influencers, all living with type 1 diabetes, then right now, you can go grab a free ticket at fearlessdiabetic.com. It's all free to register for. It's going to be a live event where we all hang out together. It's going to be a live chat where we can all talk and hang out. Just like, well, kind of just like a real live conference, but it's all online. So if you want to register for that, go to fearlessdiabetic.com. And uh, Neilani, I wanted to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, come hanging out with us and uh, sharing some tips and tricks. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And I also wanted to thank you because um, I know you do so much for the diabetic community and um, it means a lot to everybody, including myself. So thank you for everything that you do for us. Oh, you're too kind. It's my pleasure. <laughs> it's, it's so fun to hang out with people like yourself and everybody else in the community. Uh, it truly is a joy. So thank you so much, Neilani. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. For everybody else watching, make sure you go grab your free ticket at the Fearless Diabetic Summit. So fearlessdiabetic.com. We'll see you there and keep up the fight.